The recorded history of Seychelles dates back to the 16th century. The islands were appropriated and settled by France in the 18th century. Native Africans were already settled to the island, and the characteristic Seychellois Creole language developed. Britain took possession of the islands in the early 19th century. The Seychelles became an independent republic in 1976. A socialist one-party state ruled the country from 1977 to 1993. The subsequent democratic elections were won by the same socialist party. Topic: <inaudible> Pre-colonial history. The early pre-European colonization history of Isle de Seychelles or Seychelles is unknown. Malays from Borneo, who eventually settled on Madagascar, perhaps lingered here circa 200 to 300 AD. Arab navigators, on trading voyages across the Indian Ocean, were probably aware of the islands, although they did not settle them. Arabs were trading the highly valued cocoa de mer nuts, found only in Seychelles, long before European discovery of the islands. The rotted out nuts can float and were found washed ashore in the Maldives and Indonesia. Age of discoveries In 1503, Vasco da Gama, crossing from India to East Africa, sighted islands which became known as the Amarantes. The Granitic Islands began to appear on Portuguese charts as the Seven Sisters. In March 1608, a trading fleet of the English East India Company set sail for India. Lost in a storm, the Ascension's crew saw high land on 19 January 1609 and headed for it. They anchored, as in a pond. They found an uninhabited island with plentiful fresh water, fish, coconuts, birds, turtles and giant tortoises with which to replenish their stores. The Ascension sailed, and reported what they had found, but the British took no action. Towards the end of the 17th century, pirates arrived in the Indian Ocean from the Caribbean and made a base in Madagascar, from where they preyed upon vessels approaching and leaving the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. The French had occupied the Isle de France now Mauritius, since 1715. This colony was growing in importance, and in 1735 an energetic administrator, Bertrand Francois Maé de la Bourdonnais was appointed. His brief was to protect the French sea route to India. La Bourdonnais, himself a sailor, turned his attention to making a speedier passage from Mauritius to India. To this end, in 1742, he sent an expedition under the command of Lazare Pico to accurately chart the islands northeast of Madagascar. On 21 November 1742, the Elizabeth and the Charles anchored off Maé at Ans Boilo not Bay Lazare, later mistakenly named as Pico's landing place. They found a land of plenty. In fact, Pico named the island Ile de Bondance. Pico's mapping was poor, so in 1744 he was sent back and renamed the main island Maé in honor of his patron Maé de la Bourdonnais, and the group the Isles de la Bourdonnais. He had high hopes for the Isles de la Bourdonnais. However the islands were once more forgotten when La Bourdonnais was replaced in 1746. Topic. French settlement and rule The outbreak in 1754 of what would become the Seven Years' War between England and France reminded the authorities on Mauritius about the islands. Two ships were sent to claim them, commanded by Cornet Nicolas Morphy. He renamed the largest island Isle de Seychelles in honour of Viscount Jean Moreau de Seychelles, Minister of Finance during the reign of Louis XV later anglicised as Seychelles. This name was later used for the island group, whilst Maé was again used for the largest granitic island. Morphy took possession for the French King and the French East India Company on 1 November 1756. The end of the Seven Years' War, with France's loss of Canada and its status in India, caused the decline of the French East India Company, which had formerly controlled Mauritius. This settlement, and thus Seychelles, now came under direct royal authority. The new intendant of Mauritius, Pierre Poivre (1719–1786), was determined to break the Dutch monopoly of the lucrative spice trade. He thought Maé would be perfect for spice cultivation. In 1768, Nicolas de Fren arranged a commercial venture, sending ships to collect timber and tortoises from the Seychelles. During this expedition, French sovereignty was extended to cover all the islands of the Granitic Group on Christmas Day. 
In 1769, the navigators Rishon and Grenier proved that a faster route to India could safely be taken via the Seychelles, and thus the importance of the island's strategic position was realized. Meanwhile, Poivre had finally obtained seedlings of nutmeg and clove, and 10,000 nutmeg seeds. His attempts to propagate them on Mauritius and Bourbon later named Réunion met with little success, and he thought again of Seychelles. It was considered fortuitous when Brayer du Barre unknown arrived on Mauritius with royal permission to run a settlement on St. Anne at his own expense. On 12 August 1770, fifteen white colonists, seven slaves, five Indians and one black woman settled on St. Anne. Du Barre stayed in Mauritius seeking funds. After reports of initial success, he begged the government for more money. However, reports reached the authorities that ship captains could get no supplies of fresh produce from the islands. Du Barre's appeals for help to Mauritius and Versailles fell on deaf ears. In desperation, he went to the Seychelles to try and rescue the situation, but to no avail. A ruined man, he left for India and died there shortly afterwards. In 1771, Poivre sent Antoine Gillet to Seychelles to establish a spice garden. By August 1772, Du Barre's people had abandoned Saint Anne and moved to Maé or returned home. Gillet worked on at Anse Royale, establishing nutmeg, cloves, cinnamon and pepper plants. When British ships were seen around Seychelles, the authorities were spurred into action, dispatching a garrison under Lieutenant de Romainville. They built Etablissement du Roy royal settlement on the site of modern Victoria. Gillet was nominally in charge of the civilian colonists, but had no real authority over them. Mauritius sent as replacement a man of stronger metal, Jean-Baptiste Philogene de Malavois, who assumed command of the settlement in 1788. He drew up 30 decrees which protected the timber and tortoises. In future, only sound farming techniques and careful husbanding of resources would be tolerated. The Quincy era In 1790, as a result of the French Revolution, the settlers formed a colonial assembly, and decided they would run their colony themselves, according to their own constitution. Land in Seychelles should only go to the children of existing colonists, who should dispose of the colony's produce as they chose, not as Mauritius dictated. They deemed the abolition of slavery impossible, because they believed that without free labor, the colony could not survive. Jean-Baptiste Quo de Quincy took command of the colony in 1794. A wily man, he used skill and expediency to steer Seychelles through the years of war ahead. Seychelles acted as a haven for French corsairs pirates carrying lettres de marque entitling them to prey legally on enemy shipping. Quincy hoped this might go unnoticed, but in 1794 a squadron of three British ships arrived. The British Commodore, Henry Newcomb, gave Quincy an hour in which to surrender. Through skillful negotiations, Quincy obtained a guarantee of his honour and property and surrendered. The British made no effort to take over the Seychelles, it was considered a waste of resources. The settlers decided that unless they were sent a garrison, they could not be expected to defend the French flag. Therefore, they would remain neutral, supplying all comers. The strategy worked. The colony flourished. Quincy's favourable terms of capitulation were renewed seven times during the visits of British ships. On the 11th of July 1801, the French frigate Chiffon arrived with a cargo of French prisoners sent into exile by Napoleon. Then HMS Sybil arrived. Quincy had to try to defend the Chiffon, but after a brief battle, the Chiffon was taken. Captain Adam of the Sibyl wanted to know why Quincy had interfered, in contravention of his capitulation terms. Quincy managed to talk his way out of the difficulty, and even persuaded Adam to agree to Seychelles vessels flying a flag bearing the words, Seychelles capitulation, allowing them to pass through the British blockade of Mauritius unmolested. 15 September 1801 was the date of a memorable sea battle just off the settlement. The British ship Victor was seriously disabled by damage to her rigging, but she was able to maneuver broadside to the French vessel La Flèche and rake her with incessant fire. La Flèche began to sink. Rather than surrender her, her captain ran her aground, torching her before abandoning ship. The opposing commanders met ashore afterwards, the Englishman warmly congratulating his French counterpart on his courage and skill during the battle. The British tightened the blockade on the French Indian Ocean colonies. Réunion surrendered, followed in December 1810 by Mauritius. 
In April 1811, Captain Beaver arrived in Seychelles on the Nissus to announce the preferential terms of Quincy's capitulation should stand, but Seychelles must recognize the terms of the Mauritian surrender. Beaver left behind a Royal Marine, Lieutenant Bartholomew Sullivan, to monitor the Seychelles situation. Topic. British rule There was little Sullivan could do alone to stop the settlers continuing to provision French frigates and slavers. Slave ownership was not then against British law, although slave trading was illegal. Sullivan, later given the title of civil agent, played cat and mouse with the pro-slaver colonists. Once, acting on a tip-off, Sullivan was rowed over to Praslin and was able to confiscate a cargo of newly landed slaves. It was but a small triumph amidst many frustrations, and Sullivan, complaining that the Seychellois had no sense of honor, shame or honesty, resigned. The first civilian administrator of the British regime was Edward Madge. He had a bitter feud with Quincy, who remained in the administration as Justice of the Peace. In the following years, the islands became a backwater ticking over quietly. Seychellois landowners had a pleasant life, though making ends meet given the fickle markets for their produce was not always easy. The British had allowed all customary French practices to remain in place. The administrator may have been British, reporting to London, but he governed according to French rules. The biggest grievance the colonists had with their new masters was the colony's dependence on Mauritius. The other cloud on the planter's horizon was British anti-slavery legislation. In 1835, slavery was completely abolished. The plantations were already in decline, their soils exhausted by years of cultivation without investment in renewing fertility. Some planters took their slaves and left. The liberated slaves had no land, and most squatted on the estates they had tended in bondage, and the colony entered a period of stagnation. There were no exports, and no money to pay for new infrastructure. The situation was only improved when planters realized they could grow coconuts with less labor and more profit than the traditional crops of cotton, sugar, rice, and maize. Soon, they also had a source of virtually free labor once again. The British took their anti-slavery stance seriously, and operated patrols along the East African coast, raiding Arab dhows transporting slaves to the Middle East. Slaves liberated south of the equator were brought to Seychelles, and apprenticed to plantation owners. They worked the land in return for rations and wages. Over a period of 13 years from 1861, around 2,400 men, women and children were brought to Seychelles. The town, called Victoria since 1841, began to grow. Licenses granted in 1879 give some idea of the range of businesses in the town. There was a druggist, two auctioneers, five retailers, four liquor stores, a notary, an attorney, a jeweler, and a watchmaker. There was a disaster on 12 October 1862, when torrential rain and strong winds hit Ma'e. An avalanche of mud and rocks fell on the town from the hills. It has been estimated that over 70 persons lost their lives. <laughs> <laughs> Crown Colony Seychellois officials wanted Seychelles to organize as a separate autonomous colony within the British Empire, and the authorities in the mother colony, Mauritius, supported them. Sir Arthur Gordon, the Mauritian governor, sent a petition on their behalf to London. Concessions were made, but Seychelles did not become a crown colony in its own right until 1903, when its first governor, Sir Ernest Bickham Sweet Escott took office. Befitting its new status, the colony acquired a botanical gardens, and a clock tower in the heart of Victoria. The French language and culture remained dominant, however. The British, like the French before them, saw Seychelles as a useful place to exile troublesome political prisoners. Over the years, Seychelles became a home to prisoners from Zanzibar, Egypt, Cyprus and Palestine, to name but a few. The first in the line of exiles was Leela Pandak Lam, the ex-chief of Pasir Salak in Perak who arrived in 1875 after his implication in the murder of the British resident of Perak. Like many of the exiles who followed, he settled well into Seychelles' life and became genuinely fond of the islands. He took home with him one of the popular local tunes, and incorporated it into the national anthem of his country. With new words, it later became Negaraku, the national anthem of Malaysia. Perhaps the most famous of the political prisoners was Archbishop Makarios from Cyprus, who arrived in 1956. He likewise fell in love with his prison. 
when our ship leaves harbor," he wrote, "...we shall take with us many good and kindly memories of the Seychelles may God bless them all." World War I caused great hardship in the islands. Ships could not bring in essential goods, nor take away exports. Wages fell, prices soared by 150%. Many turned to crime and the prisons were bursting. Joining the Seychelles labor contingent, formed at the request of General Smuts, seemed to offer an escape. It was no easy option however. The force, 800 strong, was sent to East Africa. After just five months, so many had died from dysentery, malaria and beriberi that the Corps was sent home. In all, 335 men died. By the end of World War I, the population of Seychelles was 24,000 and they were feeling neglected by Great Britain. There was agitation from the newly formed Planters Association for greater representation in the governance of Seychelles affairs. After 1929, a more liberal flow of funds was ensured by the Colonial Development Act, but it was a time of economic depression, the price of copra was falling and so were wages. Workers petitioned the government about their poor working conditions and the burden of tax they had to bear. Governor Sir Arthur Grimble instigated some reforms, exempting lower income groups from taxation. He was keen to create model housing and distribute smallholdings for the landless. Many of his reforms were not approved until World War II had broken out, and everything was put on hold. The Planters Association lobbied for the white landowners, but until 1937 those who worked for them had no voice. The League of Colored Peoples was formed to demand a minimum wage, a wage tribunal and free health care for all. During World War II, a seaplane depot was established on St. Anne to monitor regional shipping. A garrison was stationed in the islands and a battery built at Point Conan to protect the harbour. Some 2,000 Seychellois men served in the pioneer companies in Egypt, Palestine and Italy. At home, Seychelles had turmoil of its own. The first political party, the Taxpayers' Association, was formed in 1939. A British governor described it as, "...the embodiment of every reactionary force in Seychelles." and it was entirely concerned with protecting the interests of the plantocracy. After the war, they also benefited by being granted the vote, which was limited to literate property owners, just 2,000 in a population of 36,000. At the first elections, in 1948, most of those elected to the Legislative Council were predictably members of the Planters and Taxpayers Association. In 1958, the French bought back the Glorioso Islands from the Seychelles. Independence It was not until 1964 that any new political movements were created. In that year, the Seychelles People's United Party SPUP, later Seychelles People's Progressive Front, SPPF was formed. Led by France Albert René, they campaigned for socialism and independence from Britain. The late James Mancham Seychelles Democratic Party SDP, created the same year, by contrast represented businessmen and planters and wanted closer integration with Britain. Elections were held in 1966, won by the SDP. In March 1970, colonial and political representatives of Seychelles met in London for a constitutional convention, with the Seychelles Democratic Party SDP of James Mancham advocating closer integration with the UK, and the Seychelles People's United Party SPUP of France Albert René advocating independence. Further elections in November 1970 brought a new constitution into effect, with Mancham as chief minister. Further elections were held in April 1974, in which both major political parties campaigned for independence. Following this election, negotiations with the British resulted in an agreement under which the Seychelles became an independent republic within the Commonwealth on June 29, 1976. The newly knighted Sir James Mancham became the country's first president, with René as prime minister. These negotiations also restored the islands of Aldabra, Farquhar, and Des Roches, which had been transferred from Seychelles in November 1965 to form part of the new British Indian Ocean Territory BO, to Seychelles upon independence. <laughs> One-party state On June 5, 1977, a coup d'état saw Mancham deposed while overseas, and France Albert René became president. 
The Seychelles became a one-party state, with the SPUP becoming the Seychelles People's Progressive Front In 1981, the country experienced a failed coup attempt by Mike Hoare and a team of South African-backed mercenaries. The author John Perkins has alleged that this was part of a covert action to reinstall the pro-American former president in the face of concerns about United States access to its military bases in Diego Garcia. The government was threatened again by an army mutiny in August 1982, but it was quelled after 2 days when loyal troops, reinforced by Tanzanian forces and several of the mercenaries that had escaped from the prison, recaptured the rebel-held installations. Gerard Horau, the 7th of December 1950 to the 29th of November 1985, the exiled opposition was head of the movement Pour la Résistance (MPR). His opposition to the dictatorship of René was based in London, and he was assassinated on the 29th of November 1985 by an unidentified gunman on the doorstep of his London home. Horau is buried in London. In 1985 after the assassination of Horau, the Seychelles community in exile put together a program titled SIROP, Seychelles International Repatriation and Onward Program. Involving an alliance of CDU, DP, SNP and SNP it outlined negotiations for a peaceful return of the exiles supported by a strong economic program. In February 1992, Conrad Gresley, the 19th of August 1937 to July 1993, a local accountant, landowner and advocate of multi-party democracy in Seychelles was arrested and charged with treason for allegedly planning to overthrow President René's regime with the apparent aid of foreign mercenaries and with supposed CIA involvement. Gresley died in Seychelles in July 1993 and is survived by his wife Sylvia, son Neville and daughters Natasha and Yvette Gresley. A number of Seychellois were displaced and exiled by the dictatorship. The Gresley family were one of a few landowners of largely French descent to remain after the coup d'état of 1977 most had their land confiscated and were exiled. Any individual who publicly resisted the René regime was vulnerable to threats, intimidation, or exile throughout the 1980s. Disappearances and what appear to be politically motivated killing did take place but these are not officially documented or acknowledged. A number of Seychellois families are now calling for official acknowledgement of politically motivated violence subsequent to the 1977 coup. Topic democracy Following the dissolution of the Soviet Union, at an extraordinary Congress of the Seychelles People's Progressive Front SPPF on December 4, 1991, President René announced a return to the multi-party system of government after almost 16 years of one-party rule. On December 27, 1991, the Constitution of Seychelles was amended to allow for the registration of political parties. Among the exiles returning to Seychelles was James Mancham, who returned in April 1992 to revive his party, the Democratic Party DP. By the end of that month, eight political parties had registered to contest the first stage of the transition process, election to the Constitutional Commission, which took place on July 23–26, 1992. The Constitutional Commission was made up of 22 elected members, 14 from the SPPF and 8 from the DP. It commenced work on August 27, 1992 with both President René and Mancham calling for national reconciliation and consensus on a new democratic constitution. A consensus text was agreed upon on May 7, 1993, and a referendum to approve it was called for June 15–18. The draft was approved with 73.9% of the electorate in favor of it and 24.1% against. July 23–26, 1993 saw the first multi-party presidential and legislative elections held under the new constitution, as well as a resounding victory for President René. Three political groups contested the elections—the SPPF, the DP, and the United Opposition UO, a coalition of three smaller political parties, including Party Sesolwa. Two other smaller opposition parties threw in their lot with the DP. All participating parties and international observer groups accepted the results as free and fair. Three candidates contested the March 20-22, 1998 presidential election. Albert René, SPPF, James Mancham, DP, and Wavell Ramkalawan. And once again President René and his SPPF party won a landslide victory. 
The president's popularity in elections jumped to 66.6% .6 in 1998 from 59.5% in 1993, while the SPPF garnered 61.7% of the total votes cast in the 1998 National Assembly election, compared to 56.5% in 1993. In 1999, Mancham switched to the centrist Liberal Seychelles National Party SNP, which emerged as the major opposition party, losing to the SPPF in 2002 with 42% of the vote. In 2004, René turned the presidency over to his former vice president and longtime comrade, James Michel. Michel won the 2006 presidential elections against SNP leader Wavel Ramkalawan with 53.5% of the vote. See also History of Africa List of colonial governors of Seychelles List of presidents of Seychelles Politics of Seychelles Prime Minister of Seychelles References Further reading George Bennett, Compiler, with the collaboration of Pramila Ramgulam Bennett, 1993. Seychelles. Santa Barbara, California, Clio Press. ISBN 0-585-06169-6, CS1 maint, Multiple Names, Authors List link. William McAteer, 2000. The History of Seychelles from Discovery to Independence. Mae, Seychelles, Pristine Books. ISBN 9993180904. Francis E. McGregor, 2004. A Parliamentary History of Seychelles. Seychelles, F. E. McGregor. ISBN 9993160008. Derek Scar, 2000. Seychelles since 1770, A History of Slave and Post-Slavery Society. London, Hearst. ISBN 1-85065-364-X. External links Background note, Seychelles Seychelles History A History of Seychelles Flags <laughs>